Hey everyone, Jason Sherman here with Strap On Your Boots. In today's episode, I have songwriter, entrepreneur, and author Dave Combs joining the show. Thanks for coming, man. Thank you for having me. This is going to be great. And uh, we're both musicians. We both come from a long line of family musicians. And so, uh, of course, the episode is going to be talking about how to market your song to become a hit. So before we get into that, I, I want to know uh, what instruments you play. Obviously, piano I see in the background for our listeners. Uh, Dave is sitting in front of a piano. But do you have any other instruments that you play? When did you learn how to play? What got you into music? Well, I, I'm, I was born in Tennessee, and as you may suspect, Tennessee, I think it's a requirement to be a Tennessee citizen that you've got to play some instrument. You know, Music City, Nashville is Music City, USA. So, But I grew up in a family of people who loved to sing and play. My mother, my father played the piano. My grandmother combed. She was only four foot eight. She played the old pump organ and all the harp. And so I grew up, and I guess maybe uh, probably the first instrument I probably plucked out on was uh, was my daddy put me on his knee and on the piano you know he loved to play and so he would teach me little things to do but I picked up a guitar and learned chords and so I, I strum a little I'm not a uh, guitar picker but I love you know the chords of the guitar and I have I had friends who were really great guitarists high school buddy became the jazz guitarist for the Navy jazz band so uh, it's, it's, it's around, I've been around music all my life, and so it's just part of me. That's great. It's part of your DNA. Just like my father grew up playing the piano, he's been playing, performing his whole life. My aunt has been performing guitar all around the world. My brother is a professional violinist who performs around the world. I've been playing violin and piano. So yeah, that, that's really, uh, you know, music really does kind of become part of you when you're performing and when you're around it so much so how do you translate that like how do you take that and then make it into producing like how do you there's a lot of people who can read sheet music right and they can play mm -hmm. the piano or the violin or a guitar but how do you turn that into now creating music where, where where was the moment when you realized that that was like a thing for you well i wrote a song my first song was called rachel's song i, I actually wrote the tune in 1981 didn't have a name it only got its name two years later when we i played it at our godchild rachel's christening service rachel's song and it got recorded three years later in nashville just for fun to have a demo of my song and it really jason wasn't until i got it recorded that i realized that i had something that was uh, bigger than me, you know, it was it was beyond me, because when I played it for people, they were really moved to tears or really touched by that music, and it got played on the radio and it had the same effect. So I have my MBA from Wake Forest University, so I'm a business person. My training is in business and math and physics, and and so I, th I think in terms of an entrepreneurial thing, so I, I like a monetizing things. So when you see something like a song that people like, it, and today, in today's world on the internet, it's really easy to find out if people like it because they, they literally like it <laughs> yeah. on Facebook or, <laughs> or, they or share wherever. It. Yeah. yeah, share it. So when you find something that people like, that is the first clue that you have something that could be monetized. Now, you and, mentioned the radio to me, and you know this is kind of an, an old thing because everybody's using streaming services nowadays like Spotify and Pandora and mm -hmm. iTunes. How did you get onto all of the, because apparently you got onto every easy listening radio station in the USA. I mean, that is no small feat. What was the method of infiltrating these radio stations? <laughs> well, it was a lot of phone calls and digging. Now, back then we didn't have the internet, so I couldn't go and Google anything. I had to go buy mailing lists. So I had to go to find, you know, yellow pages or where's the the uh, radio station in Chicago, all of them, you, you, there, you had to really dig to find these. So I spent a lot of time on the phone calling program directors at easy listening radio stations. Now I was able to subscribe to, I think it was called Radio and Records, uh, it was a publication back then that had a list. You could buy the lists of all the radio stations in the country. I did that. So that at least gave me a list of phone numbers. Call, I called them. And I started to send my music out to these people. They would, of course, play the song 
And I tell you, I was very fortunate. Nine out of ten of these program directors, are certainly on easy listening stations, said, man, I love this song. So they, they put it in their rotation. So that, but that was very time consuming, one after one after one. And then I discovered these music station programming companies. There's a company called Bonneville Broadcasting. Found out that they program over 200 radios across the country, radio stations. So I got a hold of that program director. He loved Rachel's song. And then instantly, boom, I go on 200 radio stations overnight. Wow. Yeah, so that's, that's kind of how it, that's how it happened. And that's no small feat because, I mean, I remember I, I got one song on the radio once. When, I think it was like the year 2000 or like 1999. <laughs> and I remember it was very difficult to get it on because you basically needed a lot of people to call in and request the song mm -hmm. so that they finally play it. And so I remember that was just like one way of getting it on. But... Nowadays, getting on the radio is more, they're, they're pulling the music from YouTube and streaming sites and TikTok and Instagram and like these new music mm -hmm. stars are becoming famous from streaming sites. So exactly. how, how do you, what do you, were you able to navigate through that as well? Have you translated your music career into the new social media era? And what did you do to kind of conform to the new ways of listening to music? Well, I did, but I, I would have to admit that my success in the uh, digital realm is certainly not as, as good as it was on, on the radios. Because if you think about it, today, everybody and his brother can create an album or a song on their computer right at home. They have a studio in their laptop that's better than the studios we used to record in that were million dollar studios. So you're in a very crowded ma marketplace. And so again, I was fortunate that as soon as I, I'm a technical person, so as soon as I found out about Pandora, man, I jumped on it. How do I get on this thing? And, and same with Spotify and iHeartRadio, all of these. So I took my music, which was already in digital form. I could, I could create MP3 files of all my songs. I got them on there early. And so you'll find that my music's on Pandora. And the way Pandora works, as you know, if your song is similar to some other person's song that's right. a big hit, they recommend you're lucky. You. Because you're going to yeah. get drug in with the big hit. So I do have a lot of airplay millions of times on my songs around the world on all these streaming platforms. But the payout, as you are I'm sure painfully aware, yes. is like 0. 0.2 pennies yeah. per yeah. stream. I mean, it is and there's, nothing. And it, there's a big issue in the music industry right now where artists are feel like they're being unfairly paid for their work. Like you mentioned, not even a penny per listener, getting a fraction of a penny. And so this is where the, the thing comes in, right? So musicians are now creating albums. They're still creating albums. They're still mm -hmm. creating music. They're putting it out there. But where they're earning the most income is from touring, right? They're going on tour yeah. and they're performing live mm -hmm. for audiences and they're earning money from merchandise, concerts, special events, Mm -hmm. uh, you know, book deals, they're getting put into movies and TV shows. They're starting to kind of really expand. So how does a musician do that? Like, I mean, this is not just because you have music doesn't mean you're going to get picked up by all these big things. How do you do that? How do you take your music and then become bigger than, like you said, bigger than yourself? Well, I think to, in today's world, it's, it's one about networking and exposure and working your contacts that's why a lot of people, for example, if they're a musician, will move to Nashville or move to L.A. or move to New York where the music centers are so that they can hopefully rub shoulders with somebody and, you know, meet somebody that knows somebody. And it's, it's, a, it's a very difficult uh, networking situation because you're, you can't just snap your fingers and do it and you're, unless you're really, really lucky that somebody hears your song and likes it and picks it up. Uh, but uh, it's it's a lot of work and a lot of uh, connection time. I'm trying to. You have to work at finding who do I know that knows somebody. It's not necessarily who you know, but who do I know that knows somebody, and maybe they know somebody. So get the get the word out. But you know, I tell all people on on a lot of these podcasts. The first thing you have to have is you have to have a good quality musical product. 
You don't want to put out a piece well, of junk. I mean, I think that works in any industry, right? Like any, if, if, you're selling, if you're selling clothing, it has to be very comfortable and fashionable. If you're selling mm-hmm. food, it has to taste good. If you're selling yeah. an, if you're selling a mobile app, it has to work well. And if it's music, it has to sound good. If it doesn't sound good, it's like watching a movie. The movie has to be good. Or this podcast, yeah. I hope people like my podcast, you know, so <laughs> I, I feel like I yeah. put out good content. So, I mean, navigating, look, I've navigated the music industry myself. I've put out a couple albums, a couple records. My father has a couple of albums. My brother has been putting out albums. We've all been putting out albums. But to reach a level of success of, say, like, you know, Pink Floyd or The Beatles or, you know, some big, you know, even, uh, you know, uh, it's Zach Perlman, the violinist, like, your skill can only take you so far nowadays, right? Uh-huh. You, ha- you you still have to, and even if you have good music, because by the way, there's a lot of good music out there in uh-huh. the art, in the artists who were just not discovered. Right. So, you know, you're, you're mentioning you have to get to Nashville or Los Angeles or New York. What if you can't get to these places because either you have a, a family personal issue you're dealing with, or you can't travel because of some problem where there's COVID and now there's a war and you're kind of afraid to leave your, your hometown. Like what other ways can you get through to the industry? Well, I think there are things just like this platform. If you can find podcasts, that uh, these people, you know, they're always looking for new artists, new, you know, th- these A&R people are looking for new material and new artists, except that it's just so crowded a, a, a field of people that it's hard to distinguish yourself. But if you can find, keep working the podcast, uh, meet, anytime you get a chance to p- appear on a media for, you know, publicity is a great way to get your music out, is if you can find r- somebody that will write an article about you and your music, maybe some... Uh, Producer will pick this article up. And say, hey, hey, we need to invite this person over and see what they sound like. So well, a, lot, you, you, a lot of these new kids nowadays, right? They're doing what you said, right? They're they're putting themselves out there on content. Have you noticed, or do you? What do you think about someone making a song, right, and then posting the song in short form? We're talking thirty seconds to a minute mm-hmm, mm-hmm. on TikTok with a funny video or dance that goes along with it. And then people are starting to use that soundbite in new ways. And then that song kind of takes off from there. Have you noticed that happening? What do you think about that? I think that's an excellent strategy. If, if, if you're able to produce something like that, if you have a, a catchy tune or a catchy phrase, something that's uh, maybe even for the, some of these TikTok things, maybe it needs to be an up, upbeat, something that kind of after a while sticks in your head, you know, you know, those earworm things. And so <laughs> if you can get something like that going, then of course that, that will help propel you in front of a, a wider audience. And somebody may pick it up and say, hey, you know, we need to do something more with this person. So I think that's a, a great, if you're able to do that and do it successfully, go for it. That's, I think it's an excellent, excellent awesome. strategy. And one thing I want you to tell my listeners before we uh, mention your book and, 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 you know, your, your whole story is how does somebody really learn a new interest and a new instrument nowadays? Like there's a lot of people out there say, I want to learn the piano. I want to learn the guitar. If you had to give somebody three tips on how to learn a new instrument today, what would you tell them? First thing I would thank goodness we have YouTube. There are tons of how to do everything you can think of on YouTube, how to play the piano, how to play a violin, how to do everything. And some are good and some are not. But you can certainly kind of survey the landscape and say, all right, which one of these teaching techniques do I really kind of connect with? Some people want to learn to play classical music, in which case you'd probably want to get a music teacher that teaches classical music, all the standard stuff. But then there are people maybe that that say no man i want to do improvisation things i want to do jazz Jazz. i want to do the creative things well there's a whole raft of things that around that and there are teachers that will fit into that mold as well but you have to be able to find those people and be very specific in interviewing your teacher there's nothing worse than saying I want to be an improvisational piano player and you get a teacher that says no I want you to play every notes on this sheet of music exactly <laughs> like it's written and if you deviate that I'm gonna knock your hand knuckles on your hands oh no you know, that that's, that, that, that's that not gonna to, work that's bringing back some bad memories from oh, my, yeah. my, my you know, violin lessons man <laughs> yeah, that's one of my pet peeves about some some music teachers that, that they bless their hearts they try their best but 
when they have a student who is very, very creative and wants to deviate from the lesson, a lot of times they discourage that, and that really upsets me. I think that should be encouraged at, to no end because every successful musician that I know, Gary Prim that did all of my recordings, yeah, he took some piano lessons when he was a kid, enough to you know how to read music, but he's a out of his head improvisation. He creates his, they call them head arrangements. I'll give him a song and he'll come out with, he won't play it the same way twice. Love and it. It, you love that kind of thing. Yeah. It's, that's, that's what gives it's, the music It's also very energy. difficult to do. I remember once I was uh, invited to a bluegrass group with my violin, my fiddle, and I, <laughs> I could not keep up with these guys, man. That, that's, that, that is hard to do. I got to tell you, man. I, you know? Yeah. So, um, yeah. Dave, yeah this Charlie, was Charlie Daniels pretty set the, <laughs> set the speed yeah. record on that. <laughs> Absolutely. They, this was fantastic. So tell people what they're going to learn about uh, if they read your book, Touched by the Music. Well, first of all, they're going to learn about my long journey with my music. This goes back 40 years. I, was, I wrote Rachel's song in 1981, so that's what, 42, 41 years ago. Okay. So this, the book is full of stories that take you from the writing of that first song to today. And along the way, as you can imagine, there are so lots many of many stories. Oh man, you know, you try this, it didn't work. You try that, it didn't work. You try, and then you stumble on something, and and it works. And it I works. mean, it's, oh, it's some great stories. So if you like stories that just kind of, as somebody said, it's a page turner. You keep, well, I wonder what happens next. <laughs> you keep keep reading about it. But I put one chapter in my book, chapter twenty one, that is full of some of the fifty thousand notes and letters that I got from my fans wow. telling me how much my music touched their life. Now, when That's I great. wanted to build myself up, I opened up my own book and start rereading some of those notes. <laughs> and they are just wonderful, wonderful, uh, positive notes and letters. Awesome. And people can pick that up at uh, comasmusic.com, correct? You go to comasmusic.com, the website, and on the left, you'll see the picture of my book. And on the right, you'll see the, the my CD of Rachel's song picture Perfect. on the right-hand side. And if you click on the links, it'll take the book. It'll take you to Amazon, and actually the CD will too. Take you. You can buy the music CDs on Amazon, or you can go to the uh, to my Combs Music. Uh, I have a physical store locally here that carries my music. And but go to my website. It's that's Perfect. the simplest yeah, Combs thing. Music, Combs Music, Music dot com. And yeah. just so the listeners and watchers, uh, the song that was playing during this episode was Rachel's song. Just so you know. And uh, Dave, thanks again for coming. It was a pleasure having you. And uh, hopefully everyone enjoys Rachel's song and picks up a copy of Touched by the Music at combsmusic.com. And we will see everybody in next week's episode.